Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. You are in the right place if you're here for Grow NYC and Kitchen Table Consultants webinar on expanding your wholesale opportunity. We are um, at 9.01 right now. I'm, well, I'm in California. 12.01 for all of you. We're just going to wait one or two more minutes for a couple more people to join, and then we'll go ahead and get started. I don't want to start too late. I want to be respectful of all those of you that hopped in on time. So we'll just wait maybe two more minutes, and we'll get going. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning at our webinar about expanding wholesale opportunities. I'm here with Eric Hassert from Grow NYC, and I'm Rebecca Frimmer from Kitchen Table Consultants. We're going to go back and forth a little bit this morning and, and share the presentation a bit, but I'm going to let Eric get started and talk about why we're all here today and give us a little intro, and then I'll jump back in. Hey, how's everyone doing today? Uh, my name's Eric Hassert. Uh, so we had met with uh, Kitchen Table Consultants back in, I believe it was December of 2018. Uh, we uh, at Farm Roots, which is our technical assistance division of our Grow NYC Green Markets team, uh, we had been working on a project uh, trying to connect our New York State uh, farmers uh, with individuals who were interested in uh, buying more locally for their wholesale uh, businesses. And so we had been working on some uh, crop costing models as well as looking at different solutions uh, to get some of our farmers market uh, farmers into wholesale opportunities. And so in so doing, uh, found bumped into uh, Elaine Lemon and Rebecca Frimmer from Kitchen Table Consultants who were uh, working on similar projects but for institutional sales. And we're really impressed with a lot of the tools that they had developed. So. Uh, we've done a workshop with them up in Hyde Park that was really successful and then uh, have now uh, had two webinars under our belt, uh, one focusing on crop costing models uh, and one focusing on how to set up your chart of accounts uh, for QuickBooks for farming operations. And so this is the third and final uh, round of our webinar series and we're really happy to have Rebecca working with us on it. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what the wholesale marketplace looks like. Uh, and what are some really great strategies and opportunities and potentially challenges as well uh, to selling into that marketplace. And so with that, uh, Rebecca is going to be handling the majority of uh, this presentation. I'll pop in with a couple different uh, side notes from our presentation in Hyde Park, uh, but I'll let Rebecca take it from here. Sure. You know, Eric, before I get started, do you want to tell them about where to find the other resources that we did together in the webinar? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so if you want to look on www.grownyc.org, that's G-R-O-W-N-Y-C, like New York City, .org, uh, slash farm roots, um, you'll see we have a variety of resources there uh, in our sidebar, but it's going to be um, available under our wholesale readiness section. Um, and I can send that link out to anybody who attends the webinar today. Um, and that'll have uh, the crop costing model along with the previously recorded webinars, uh, as well as some resources that Kitchen Table Consultants and Rebecca developed for setting up your chart of accounts. Um, and then I think today, uh, Rebecca will also be discussing a sales pipeline tool um, that we'll have listed there um, in addition to the presentation we did in Hyde Park. So that way you guys get the full suite um, and yeah, if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to either myself or Rebecca. And uh, just so everyone who's in attendance is uh, aware, uh, we do have some additional consulting work that we've been doing with uh, the producers who are in, in attendance with 
uh, at our webinars that you can work with Rebecca for about an hour and a half. We have a, a free uh, consulting on either the crop costing tools or setting up your chart of accounts. So there's still a few hours available there. Uh, so feel free to reach out to myself or Rebecca if you're interested in taking advantage of that. Um, Eric, I think we just lost your audio, so I'm going to take over. But um, it sounds like there's some really awesome birds in the background where you are. <laughs> so listen, um, take advantage of that opportunity, you guys, because there is some grant funding that Grow NYC has to make sure people get some opportunities for follow-up one-on-one consulting. And it's a great opportunity to take advantage of that at no cost to you, and it's going to get used up and run out. And it's first come, first serve. So email Eric or email me if you want to go ahead and use some of that time. Before we go ahead and dive into the content, just a like quick, quick housekeeping issues. If you have any trouble with Zoom, um, the best thing to do is probably just pop off and pop right back on if you have any like major lags in being able to hear. Um, if you have questions as we go, go ahead and type them into the chat, which if you look at your uh, Zoom interface, there's a little three bar, three dot matrix on the right. If you click that, you can get to the chat. Eric will be monitoring the chat while I talk and will stop me if we have questions that we want to answer. We'll stop a couple times periodically to see if we can answer some questions or you can type them into the q and I can see there's a couple in there right now. Maybe Eric could take a quick look um, and we'll go from there. So, you know, without any, any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So, um, my name is Rebecca Frimmer. I work with Kitchen Table Consultants. We are a company that's based in Pennsylvania, but is across the nation. I am in Morrow Bay, California. We're a collective of entrepreneurs who are dedicated to helping farmers, food system professionals, and economic development groups build lasting, profitable, locally focused businesses. Um, we work with a lot of farmers and small food makers, the folks you'd see at your local farmer's market. And um, we're all, either current or former business owners. So we know what it feels like to walk in your shoes and to have to figure out how to make payroll no matter what's going on with your business. And we're there for you to help you. These are some of the things that we do. And we operate by four tenants that drive um, the soul of what we do. And so we just wanna work hard and help you get the job done and be honest with you and train you to do all of these things yourself. So you know the whole teach a person to fish philosophy is, is how we operate. So first I wanna just start off by, uh, we'll dive right in. I wanna start off by talking about wholesaling in general. You know, once we have an understanding of what wholesaling actually means, I think this whole topic really breaks down into like two big chunks of material. One of those is like the logistics of wholesaling, like the what should I grow? How should I grow? Why should I do this? Who's my target customer? And then the second bucket of information is around sales best practices. You know, sales can be really intimidating it's the kind of uh, thing where you have to learn to deal with some rejection and pick yourself back up and keep going. And it can be really discouraging. And I think that the part where most small producers get stuck is in the sales process. Um, it, can be, it can be difficult to keep going back when you hear no until you figure out how to get better at finding that right fit to even start your conversation with in the first place. So we're gonna talk quite a bit about sales best practices today and give you a tool that you can use. But first we're gonna talk about wholesaling in general and some of the things you might wanna think about as you're starting to get into that side of the business. So what is wholesaling? There, believe it or not, I think a lot of people have some different thoughts about what this actually means. Wholesaling means that you are selling your product to an entity that will be reselling your product, like a restaurant or a store. They could be reselling your product in the same form that you gave it to them, or they could be changing the form of that product and then selling it. Both of those are called wholesaling. You know, I've, I've had some conversations with farmers where they're like, well, I sell directly to the restaurant, so that's not wholesaling, but it is. There's two different kinds of wholesaling. There's direct, where we're going like farm to restaurant, farm to grocer, um, and then it can, or it can also be mediated, or some people use the term intermediated, which means that you're going to a middle party before it gets to the uh, vendor that's buying your product in the first place. So customer that's buying your product in the first place, excuse me. So in a mediated environment, you're the farmer, you're gonna sell to a distributor or a food hub or some kind of middle entity, and then they're gonna go ahead and sell to their customers, which might be restaurants, grocery stores, you know, small food manufacturers, any of those types of customers that would be 
utilizing your product. So obviously you can probably get a little bit of a higher price if you can wholesale directly because there isn't that middle party. However, you have to shoulder all of the logistics yourself usually. Um, the benefit to intermediated or mediated wholesale is just that the entity that you're selling to already has customers and logistics in place. So let's talk a little bit about building your wholesale clientele. So if this is just something that you're starting to think about as, as far as getting into wholesaling in general, like let's say you have a farm and you're just going to the farmer's market and you're selling directly to your customers or you have CSA subscription and you're, and you're doing direct sales and you're starting to think about how can I expand my business? Do I even want to go into wholesale? I grow a whole lot of different things. How do I start to like filter down and think about what is the right step for me? So the three things you really want to think about outlining from the start are identifying your offering. So what is the product that I want to offer? And what is the equation of price versus cost? Okay, I'm going to pause for one second. I think I need to figure out, um, I probably have to mute somebody so that we don't get a bunch of background noise. There we go. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for waiting. So when I say price versus cost, this speaks to the crop costing module that we did in our, in our last webinar. How do you know if you're going into wholesale, if the product that you're going to be selling is going to be profitable at that lower price point, right? Especially if you're a farmer that's only been doing mixed direct sales and maybe you haven't been tracking all that information. So in a scenario where you're growing like 30 to 50 different crops, and you're going, you're, you're building a CSA box and you're going to farmer's market, how much tracking are you really doing on the cost of growing that crop versus the price? You're probably really just looking at everything as a mixed bundle and saying, am I profitable at the end of the season? And so once we want to go into wholesale, it can be a little bit dangerous to keep, you know, things kind of that loosey goosey because you're probably going to be focusing the majority of your wholesale business in a handful of crops, if that, maybe two, maybe three or four, at least to start. And so if you're going to drop that price point, you could be putting yourself in a position where you're doing a whole lot of additional work um, and growing a whole lot of additional crop, but potentially not making any profit. So it is important to calculate out and use the crop costing model or whatever tool you may have on your own to determine if that price point is really going to produce a profit for you, if, you know, as they say, the juice is going to be worth the squeeze. I mean, you're going to be doing a whole lot of work and you're going to be committed to a customer. So you need to make sure that decision is profitable. And that is the, probably the most important thing that I will say in this entire webinar, but stay tuned. We have some more good stuff. Um, but just don't get into a situation where you don't understand your profit margin. Um, the next thing you want to do is identify your delivery radius. So really thinking about how many miles are you willing to go? Uh, how far do you want to drive? What's the traffic situation like in your region? How much time can you spend on logistics in this endeavor? Or do you have someone that you can pay to deliver and drive? Um, and the reason I say radius is because you're going to have to do some research to figure out who these potential target customers are. So for me, a really nice first step in, you know, building wholesale sales and an operation is to just take a map out, put a dot where your farm is, and then think about you know, how far are you willing to drive to execute the logistics of this operation and just put a circle on the map and then start looking for potential targets within that area. It doesn't make sense to start looking three or four hours away. There's certainly going to be customers a whole lot closer than that. So, you know, start with like a tight radius for your logistics to keep your costs down and to keep the time and effort in the car down and then go ahead and go from there. So the third point I'd like to make is about um, outlining your logistics. So really thinking about what kind of room you have in your operation um, to, to get out there and deliver the goods. Are you going to have, you know, thinking about, and also the use of your current vehicle, right? So if you're using your refrigerated vehicle to go to market or deliver CSA, how much availability do you really have to get these goods out? And then think about how you can fit in a certain number of customers or a route before you really start chasing something that you may or may not be able to deliver. So thinking about your business, how it all fits together, what resources you have available that you already own, and then that may lead to discussions on additional resources that you might need to, to fulfill the job. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about how you even start the process of finding your buyers. There's a lot 
of businesses out there that buy food. So how do you find the ones that are going to be a match for, for you? And I think that the values behind the food that you grow are going to be a big part of finding that match. What's important to you and the sustainability and the, and the values in your farm are going to be important to the buyers also that are buying your food. So if you have an operation, for example, that is organic certified, and so you're expecting a higher price point than somebody that maybe is not organic certified. You want to find a buyer that that's important to as well. Otherwise, it's probably not really a good match. So here are some bullet points that I mapped out for you, just thinking about how to find somebody that's going to jive with your business and, and what you want to achieve here. So organic and other sustainable certifications is the first one. Maybe your animal welfare approved. Maybe you know you have some other certification that would be valuable to a buyer. Um, food safety certifications such as GAP could be important to certain buyers as well, especially schools or other institutional buyers. Thinking about payment terms, are you prepared to extend your receivables? Are you prepared to wait to get paid? Because certain businesses or, or organizations are only going to do terms, like pay you net 30, because they have to submit billing to an accounting department and it has to go all the way around the organization and back. It's not as simple as like selling to like an independent small food manufacturer that's happy to write you a check when they receive the goods. So thinking about that fit as well, do you even have the cash flow to extend terms and receivables? Logistics terms are important too, where the delivery specifications of the buyer. I mean, some of these, you know, big national companies that are either quick service food chains or small food manufacturers that do buy, you know, from local regions have so many terms around their logistics, like very specific delivery windows. It has to be a refrigerated truck, things of that nature, that if you can't meet those terms, there's really no point in even filling out that monster stack of paperwork to get involved. Um, I was recently having a conversation with somebody who wanted to approach a, a national quick service chain to sell them goods, but they were still so small and they didn't have the resources. And my recommendation to them was to just wait a couple years until their business was more on its feet and see if they could meet those terms. But currently it just felt like it was spinning wheels as an example. Um, other buyers are going to be looking for consistency you know, things like, you know, size and grading, or even just like very strong consistency of availability or delivery times. They may be looking for certain quantities. They might be looking for very specific packaging, whether it's, you know, green packaging or um, a specific type of packaging for their grocery shelf. And then as well, they might be looking for niche products. Like, do you grow some kind of variety that nobody else grows. That could be appealing to somebody. And then some of the other things are season extension, right? Do you have high tunnels or some other way of providing goods outside of your competition? Um, you know, how sensitive is this buyer to price point? So if you are um, a really small operation that does a lot of handwork and you can't necessarily offer the lowest possible price point, then certain buyers are not going to be a fit for you. And then of course there's navigating paperwork. I mean, when we look at some of the bigger um, opportunities for wholesale, like Whole Foods and things like that, they come with a mountain of paperwork. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what's your tolerance for that? And how do you, how do you feel about moving forward in, in that type of space? So if you're looking to work with other small businesses, if you wanna, if you have larger quantities and need to work with bigger businesses, you can start to, um, narrow down who the best kinds of fits are going to be. So with that, I think we're going to move over to Eric for a couple of slides. You ready? Sorry about that. Uh, I lost, lost it for a second there. So I've actually been offline for the last three or four minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, so we are jumping into farmer's market sales are decreasing. Is that where we're at? You got it. Great. Um, okay. So as uh, we've heard from many of the farms in our uh, green markets that are in New York City, uh, they've been seeing across the board at a variety of different uh, market locations, as well as in upstate New York, um, they've been seeing a drop in farmers market sales uh, overall revenue. And, um, and despite the fact that uh, there's been an increase in overall uh, farmers market locations, and uh, as well as uh, interest in local foods uh, throughout the region, um, there has been, because of that, the pot is basically being shared by more people. 
um, from you know, online grocery to uh, ready to eat such as, uh, or ready to cook such as Blue Aprons and such. Uh, Amazon Fresh is now getting into that. Um, and then there's also a variety of uh, strategies from, um, from different uh, competitors who aren't necessarily even uh, partaking in the type of agriculture that uh, the majority of you are. Uh, and so there's a lot of greenwashing going on. And so your, um, the message that you're sending to your customers uh, may be diluted uh, due to the fact that they don't necessarily know uh, who to trust and such. And so uh, all this kind of comes into play uh, on top of the fact that farmers markets inherently are relatively uh, inconvenient for most shoppers. And so uh, finding different ways to actually diversify your revenue stream and mitigate some of the risks that may be involved uh, with selling at an open air seasonal market um, and how you can have a good cash flow is a really great way uh, to bolster your business and uh, make sure that your farm's viability is strengthened. So if you could go to the next slide, Rebecca, that'd be great. Um, so as I was saying, uh, there's definitely unmet demand and opportunity out there. Um, there's an increase in the amount of uh, local food interests. Um, with 87% growth uh, you see in local foods uh, at grocery stores. However, uh, the majority of customers who are shopping at those grocery stores feel that their uh, individual uh, grocery stores aren't, are lacking in local food products. And so there's a lot of really uh, great opportunity available and that's just in the retail market. Um, there's also um, a, a bunch of chefs, uh, not only in the New York City marketplace, but also uh, a growing demand upstate. Um, and throughout the region uh, for chefs who are trying to source more directly from their farmers, uh, which causes a lot of different uh, logistical issues and such, but uh, there's a lot of interest there from, um, and a lot of new opportunities with some mission-based distributors who are uh, kind of going the extra mile to make sure that they're connecting and sourcing as fresh and quality product as they can and uh, have a really, um, uh, have great, um, connections and networks of local chefs that they can connect you to without you even having to necessarily leave the farm in some cases. Um, so uh, let's see, yeah, if you wanna to go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so we touched on this hey, for a Heather, second. Can I yeah. throw in there, do you, are you at liberty to say any of the names of those distributors? Yeah, of course. Okay, so people, like that's the juicy stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. So people um, can look up online and, and just start understanding that there are some of these more like values and missions focused distributors and start to understand what might be that better fit. Sure, not a problem. Um, so we had uh, Hudson Valley Harvest is a really great distributor. Uh, they actually have just combined a few different distribution companies uh, in the Northeast. And so um, they have Kate Galassi, who is their president, uh, has doing a really great job at, um, she's been in the industry for years, uh, both as a forager as well as working for a small distribution company, an import company called Natura out of New York City um, that focuses in on specialty produce and locally grown produce. Um, and they really are a mission-based, value-based uh, distributor who treat the farmers right and really understand uh, the challenges that come with growing in uh, the climate that we uh, that we are forced to grow in um, and that we are the marketplace that uh, has a ton of interest in sourcing from farms, but uh, not necessarily the access to it. Um, other, far, other distributors that are interesting, uh, Farm to Tables, uh, Farms to Tables is uh, really great, but they're not necessarily taking on additional farmers as the last that I spoke with them. Um, and then I think uh, one of the new types of uh, buyers that's in the marketplace um, is fast casual chains. Um, so they're taking some of the farm to table movement and bringing it into a larger scale, um, but they're trying to keep uh, a smaller connection, a connection to smaller producers. And so I have rotating menus that allow them to source uh, seasonally. Um, and they all also allow them to make last minute adjustments uh, at the variety of their locations. Uh, they have commissary kitchens, which make it easier for farmers to drop off at one location versus 20 locations. Um, there's a lot of solutions that are coming out of that. And, um, and so I think that it's not usually when we talk to farmers about wholesale, uh, especially farmers who have been in the marketplace for a while and have seen uh, the fluctuations in price that have happened, uh, fruit growers I'm thinking of specifically, uh, where the marketplace doesn't really allow for the types of growing practices that they're trying to do and the scale that they're at. Um, so uh, now I think that when you talk to a grower, you're not, when you say wholesale, you're not meaning dropping off your 
product for the lowest point or for no uh, quote of a price at all at Hunts Point, and then finding out, you know, a couple days later that your product sold for 50% of what you thought it was going to, and there's nothing you can really do about it. And that's just not a f fair relationship uh, to establish, especially when the profit margins are so thin in agriculture in the first place. Um, so uh, thinking about wholesale, I think uh, some of the suggestions Rebecca is going to um, talk to you about are really important because uh, there's a lot of different types of uh, customers that you can be approaching that I think can help bolster those direct-to-consumer um, risks and uh, they can help bring some improved cash flows throughout the uh, quieter season and uh, they can also spread some of your marketing costs across different uh, market channels. Um, do I have one more slide in there or is it switch back to you at this point? Yeah. Oh, yep, yeah, here Look, we go. You have this one more about <laughs> market study. Uh, so our friend Becca Jablonski, who works for the Colorado State University, uh, has been working on um, looking at different uh, profitability uh, models for different scales of farm. And so uh, I'll give a link to the full report here, but this was one really interesting uh, graph that she had where you can see uh, that producers who were uh, both <clears throat> at all different scales when they had a combination combination of market channels they were always more profitable and then especially producers who were in the mid region which was about 75,000 to 350,000 um, they were uh, typically doing uh, a much higher level of profitability and getting a higher return on their assets um, so this if you dig deep into this like we when i presented in hyde park this is about a 20 minute conversation this slide so um, i would encourage any of you to go back and look at uh, the report once uh, we finished up with this and linked it up um, and it's listed at the bottom there local food economics um, thank you very much for circling that <laughs> uh, and yeah, I think it would be a, it's really a great way to dig in and really understand. This was based on 30,000 different farmers throughout, uh, performed by the USDA, uh, a survey performed by them. So this is throughout the whole country, so not necessarily specific to the Northeast. Um, they're actually currently working on a report uh, that is uh, located uh, in our region. But uh, for the time being, uh, I think that this is a really great starting point to understand that if you are uh, looking to be the most profitable, it's, it's always get best to be mixed um, rather than just focused on one uh, type of customer base. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Um, you know, this study is really interesting. I haven't had a chance to review everything about it, but the, you know, the one thing I wanna say is that it just makes the point that uh, your return on investment with your assets is, directly correlated to how profitable you are, which makes sense, right? Like if you're, if you're sinking down in debt and you're not making a return on the investments that you've made in your, on your assets, then you're probably gonna be in trouble. So it's really just about finding ways to maximize the return on the equipment investments that you make. So if you purchase a piece of equipment to be more efficient at growing something specific, you know, you wanna try to utilize that piece of equipment as much as possible and get the best return on it. So hold on one second, let me go back to my slide deck here and we'll move forward. So we talked a little bit about some of the things you wanna think about to figure out if you're, if you're a good match for your buyer. You know, it's kind of like dating. What do you have in common? Where do you guys see eye to eye? And then you can start building a relationship from there. But it really is about relationships. So when you're trying to find your buyer and identify your target customer, you can think about the types of organizations that might be a good match for you. You know, maybe, School districts are a good match for you because you're a fruit grower and they buy a lot of fruit in hand. Maybe you have some post-harvest processing equipment where you can deliver lettuce or carrots in a different way that would be useful to that organization. Um, maybe you have certain certifications that are around food safety that would be valued, valuable to a hospital. Um, other institutions are also an option, obviously restaurants, retailers, specialty grocery. What else is there? You know, there obviously Eric was talking about quick service restaurants. There are the small food manufacturers out there that are making like, you know, pickled everything and all, all kinds of different prepared food products where they need local food inputs. So just thinking about what's in your region, what's a good match for you, and then starting to actually research prospects. So it's not just about who, so first I would start with who you know and where you have some connections and start having those conversations. 
but there's a discovery process. There are going to be things happening in your region that you don't know about yet. So you're going to get online and you're just going to start searching for the types of organizations here that you think are a good fit for you and then move forward. Um, going to different events in your region that are focused on your industry is also a great way to start meeting other people that could potentially be buyers. So once we start this process of researching prospects, how do we keep track of it all? How do we make progress? How do we move on to the next place of actually like starting to set up meetings, sampling our goods, finding out what the price would need to be to sell to this entity that we're researching? The next step is going to be to start recording them in a pipeline document and tracking your progress. So what is a pipeline document? We're going to get back to that in just a second and I'll demo one and share it with you. But I just want to finish this conversation about meeting your buyers first and then we'll go on to that. So, you know, often the question comes up, I'm going to go meet with somebody or I'm going to start making calls to these prospects and start figuring out who might actually be a target customer out of my prospects. What do I need to have prepared? Uh, what should I already have on hand so that if they're excited and they want to schedule a meeting with me, I'm ready to go and I don't have to wait and put the brakes on because the fastest way to kill a sale is to not move when they're ready. So these are some of the things you want to prepare. You want to know what your pricing is going to be. You want to have already done that crop costing work on the offerings that you'd like to make wholesale and Understand what is the lowest possible price that you're willing to take. Not that you should take the lowest possible price that you're willing to take every time, but you need to understand what that bottom threshold is because you might say like, I'm really not willing to do any work where I'm not at least making a 20% margin. Maybe you need a higher margin. Think about the extra land that you're going to be using to grow for a specific wholesale contract, you know, what's the return? You want to have an availability list ready to go. Uh, you want to understand what your current availability is. You want to have a seasonal availability list where there are specifics on how much volume you can produce of different crops in different seasons. So, you know, you probably know what you can produce on your entire farm, but how much of that do you want to be set aside for your wholesale channel? You need to have a business card or some kind of print document with your name and your farm information on it. I would also recommend that you have a sales sheet, which is really just, you could combine this with your current availability document. It's just a one page document with the name of your farm, uh, your value proposition, and then you know what you have available and at what price and i would put the price that you'd like you can always negotiate down and give somebody a discount to get to that bottom pricing if that's where you decide you need to go so what is value proposition let's just talk about that for a second um, the value proposition is the unique characteristics of your business that make choosing to work with you better than the competition or the next best alternative. So it's about your, your growing practices and your values and the way that you treat your workers or the way that you keep your farm more sustainable than the next guy or the really awesome green packaging that you use that's biodegradable or compostable or whatever it is. Those are all parts of your value proposition. So you really wanna make sure they're clear to the buyer so that they're not missing any of the awesome reasons that they should be working with you. And then also, so when you sit down with them, you don't get nervous and then forget to explain why your, your farm is this amazing operation that they should want to work with. Okay, and then obviously you also want to bring some really nice samples with you. So to create your first wholesale pricing, first you've got to do some research on your local pricing. So then you can use the crop costing tool to walk through and make sure that you'll turn a profit at that price. Listen, you can't be so far off of market pricing just because you're extra awesome you have to be at least somewhat close to where they can buy the next best alternative or like the value proposition probably isn't going to be worth it to the buyer to spend so much extra money. Um, so you can do some research, you can, you know, find out from other farmer friends, have some conversations at the farmer's market, call up some people, maybe ask one of your local service providers, somebody like Eric or me to put you in contact with someone in your area that's already selling wholesale and just like have a conversation farmer to farmer about how it's going for them with pricing, okay, before you go ahead and, and put yourself out there completely in the dark.
never a good place to start. Okay, so what's the pipeline document? It's blurrier than it sounds. We're gonna walk through it right now. A pipeline document, it's just a spreadsheet. It's a document that keeps track of your progress by each of your potential customers so that you can keep track of where you left off and what you're gonna do next. And it's a way of tracking how you're doing over time. The term is called close rate in sales. Like for all of the sales that you go out and pitch, how many do you close? What's that percentage? And then you can work that number backwards to tell you how many leads you need. So let's say your goal based on all the calculations that you've done or that you need three wholesale customers buying at a certain volume to get yourself to a goal. And then you know if you only close 50% of the sales that you pitch that you need at least six, right? If you wanna close three, you need at least six prospects to get out there and talk to and then start. Your 50% is a pretty good close rate for sales. You might be lower than that. So if your sales, if your close rate is 25% and you want three customers, then you know you need to go out there and pitch it to 12, okay? So that gives you an idea of how full you need to make your pipeline to get out there and reach your goals. Um, and as you keep track over time, you'll learn, you know, if you're really good at finding like very appropriate target customers and you're good at getting that pitch in, then your rate might be really high. Like you could have a close rate of 75 or 80% if you're really good at finding the right prospects. The only reason you need to know your close rate over time is so that you understand like how much work you have to do out there pitching your products to get yourself to a place where you're going to get the number of customers that you want to meet your financial goal. Okay, so what goes into the pipeline? Information for the targeted business, your prospects. So even as you're researching, you just list all your prospects out in the, in the pipeline. I promise I'll show it to you in a second. The type of business, the name of the decision maker, their contact information, the date that you started. So you can get an idea of how long the sales process takes you. Once you track it for six months to a year, you'll know exactly what you're working with here. And so you'll know if it takes you three to four months to close a wholesale account with the buyer between the paperwork and the pitching and the sampling and the back and forth, then based on your seasonality, you kind of know when you really need to step on the gas in order to reach those goals in time for season. Okay. And then it lets you keep track of each contact with that said buyer, what happened and when did it happen, and then create some next steps for yourself. And also select what stage of progress this particular prospect or deal is in. And that way you can sort your pipeline by stage and figure out who you really need to prioritize talking to this week if your time is limited. So this tool really is valuable from a sales perspective. Um, businesses that do a lot more sales probably use a software version of a pipeline. It's called CRM, a, a customer relationship management software where some of the reminders and things become automated. But if you get to the point where you feel like you've outgrown the pipeline, then go ahead and look at that. But if you are just getting started, this will be plenty for you for at least the first year. Okay, so when you're in a pipeline, you can make up your own or you can use ours. I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up now and we'll, we'll walk through that together. Okay. So, just wanna maximize this. Okay, there we go. So here's an example of a pipeline that's pretty empty. And you start by putting in the name of the business. So this is a farm I used to manage. And then you want to select the stage that you're in. So pretty much, if you're just starting to populate ideas about who you might want to target, they're all going to be prospects. Okay, so we'll just start with prospects for now. Put the location, the type of business, co-op. You put the name of the decision maker, the date that you created this lead, the phone number, the email address, and then first contact, emailed, no response, right? That's pretty, pretty straightforward, but you probably want to know how long it's been since you sent that email. And then three weeks later, pick up the phone and call and leave a message. So in this particular case, this is a very slow effort to try to get in touch with an organization that somebody might want to sell to. I think that, you know, contacting and then waiting a week and then contacting again in the beginning is a, is a great rhythm because you're going to sit down and work with your pipeline probably twice a week so you can see where you left off. So there's a couple of ways that, and then it just goes on, contact next step, contact next step. So there's a couple of ways that you can work with this document once you get it populated. But a couple of the fields that I want to talk about are the pipeline stage. So we have the stages listed out here. You can make your own stages or you can follow ours. So the stages that we use are prospect, which means like you're just thinking about it. 
initial contact, you've scheduled a meeting. Stage four is you've scheduled that first meeting and dropped off samples. Uh, stage five is you're following up after the first meeting. Stage six is the negotiation of the opening order. Stage seven is just like stalled and waiting for follow-up. So if you get to the point where they're interested, and you're trying to get through to that first order, you might leave them in that stalled stage. And then you can either close it as one or close it as lost. So there are a couple places where this process can stall. Generally, the ones that you really wanna pay attention to are the ones that are stalled out after the first meeting. Because you've actually met this person now, you've begun to build a relationship, they've tried your product, they've expressed interest, at this point, you either need to get a yes or you need to get a no. And we'll talk about no in a second because no is probably not really no forever. But if you get a yes, you can move on. If you're stalled in that stage, you don't want to drop the ball on contact. You want to keep following up in a polite and respectful and excited way to work with them and just, you know, keep at it until you either get that order or you tell them or they tell you that they're not interested right now that something in their organization has changed they can't make that purchase at this time okay and then if somebody tells you no is it really a no how many times have somebody tried to sell you something and you said no i don't think so and then they come back to you a few months later and say hey wondering if it's a good fit now there's nothing wrong with doing that so unless someone says like, it's a no, it's a no forever, please don't call me again, I don't wanna work with you. Those are some pretty strong words. But if they're like, yeah, I really can't buy that right now or season is full, there are follow-up questions you can ask. You can say, so when do you do your purchasing for next season? Or we'd love to work with you in the future. Do you see an opportunity for us next year? What's a great time to follow up with you? December, November, get them to have a conversation with you about turning the no into a maybe and then put that date on your calendar through the pipeline so that you know in November, I have to follow up with this guy. That's when they do their purchasing and selection for next year. If I follow up with him at the right time of year, I can probably get on their inventory list. So just asking all those questions, taking the ego out of hearing no, so that you can clearly think about the follow-up questions that you wanna ask, and just understanding that no is part of the sales process. Like you're gonna pitch all of these prospects that you wanna sell wholesale and people are gonna tell you no. And you just have to get to that next phase of understanding, is it, a, is it a hard no or a soft no? And then how do I proceed from there? So going back to the pipeline for just a moment, there's also a couple of tabs here where you can move over new customers created so that you don't see them in the pipeline anymore. And then you can also move over um, pipeline leads that you've lost and have a reason why. And you may even decide to standardize these reasons so that you can sort them and see if there are specific reasons over time that will help you do a better job at selecting the right prospects for your business. Okay, so we looked at the pipeline example. And the main thing that you wanna learn from this exercise is that it's a tool for how to prioritize your time. So if you sort the pipeline by stage or by most recent activity, then you can choose how you want to spend your time and who you should follow up with today. So if you have, for example, people you've made initial contact with that haven't scheduled their meeting yet, or you have somebody that stalled in negotiation of their opening order that you already have a relationship with, and you only have so much time today because you got to get on the tractor because the weather is good and so on and so forth, then you're going to focus on those that are either stalled in stage five or six, not the prospects in, or those that are in stage one, right? So it gives you a way to sort and prioritize how to spend your time. So, and another thing you can ask yourself is about how many leads you have in different stages and where you need to push yourself in this process or if you need to work on your pitch. So if everybody's getting stuck in the beginning, it's probably an issue of the pitch or your confidence and your ability to sell your product. Um, so it's just about practice and maybe finding another friend that's a farmer that's in the same position or that has a small business that has to go out and sell and you guys work on it together. Uh, it helps to practice your pitch with yourself multiple times before you get out there. Or if you actually get stuck in getting meetings scheduled, or if you get stuck in pushing for that order, you can figure out where you might want to develop a few scripts for yourself so you feel really comfortable and confident and can move forward and try to turn around that place where you're getting stuck. So some of the questions you'll ask yourself over time with this pipeline tool 
are how long does it take me to sign up a new customer? That's that time from start to finish, that onboarding period. Where am I losing potential leads, right? What is the result and reason for those that are close and lost? Is it my competition? Is it my price? Is it fit with the organizations that I'm approaching? Like if I'm a really small farmer using sustainable practices and my cost might be higher, I might not be best approaching a school or a hospital or even a really large grocery store. I'm gonna be better off with like a boutique gourmet specialty grocer that is more about quality and messaging, right? So it's about finding that fit. Um, if it's mostly poor fit, how can you do a better job of populating your pipeline with those that are potential wins as opposed to things that might be a force for fit? Okay, this is, the, this is the thing about the pipeline. Checking in with leads by stage, your average days to closing a deal, and your reasons for loss could be a monthly or quarterly task that keeps you driven and improving. It's really important to feel good about doing this work because it's hard to keep it in your routine if you're feeling negative about hearing no or if you feel like things are not progressing. So that monthly metrics check-in, how many leads in each stage, how many days to close, how many do I have almost ready to close? Why am I losing customers are all helpful in motivating you to move forward. This is about a process. It's about dedicating that specific time every single week to sales. So you might say like, oh, if I look at my calendar for the week or my planting plan or whatever I have to do, I can see that Tuesday morning and Friday afternoon, I have time to make sales calls. So clearly Friday afternoon is not a good time to call a chef in a restaurant, right? So you probably want to have like two different time windows throughout the week that you can reach out to your potential leads and then also understand what the right time is to reach out to people in different types of organizations. And so try to schedule 30 to 60 minutes on your calendar twice a week to work on sales if this is really something that you want to achieve. Does this sound really hard to do? It really just requires discipline. A regular routine is the key to success. So once you get set up with like the mechanics of the pipeline, which frankly are fairly simple if, you're, if you know how to use Excel, um, and then once you get set up with having your availability sheet with a little bit about your value proposition and your business card and your little sample kit ready to go, from there, it's really just about discipline. If you're spending that hour twice a week, even in the beginning, you're probably just gonna be filling up with prospects until you're ready to start reaching out and you have like a nice little handful of prospects you wanna reach out to you still need to dedicate that time or you're never even gonna do the research to get the prospects in the pipeline. So it is about discipline and regular check-ins with where you're at, follow-up communication. Um, so don't let uncertainty stop you from trying. You've, you've gotta get out there and put yourself out there if you wanna achieve new sales. And it's a little scary at first, but you know, once you do it a few times, you'll find it may actually be enjoyable to you to start meeting more business people in your community. Listen, everybody, thank you so much for attending and for listening and for all your good questions. I'm going to leave this format open for about two more minutes in case anybody needs to type anything else into the chat. And then I'll go ahead and copy it out and close out the webinar. But thank you so much for attending and for, for listening. I really appreciate all of your time. And have a great day. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. And uh, thanks again to uh, New York Farm Viability Institute for making this possible. Uh, but yeah, we look forward to working with uh, anybody who attended and please feel free to check out the crop costing webinar and the tools provided there, as well as the chart of accounts and how to set that up for QuickBooks. And again, feel free to reach out uh, to either of us if you have any questions further. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.